Good morning. We are here this morning, first and foremost, to honor the Lord and also to honor our graduated seniors. But we're also here to, to honor Phil. I wouldn't be able to be standing here if it weren't for Phil Weinberger. Um, as a woman in ministry, he has given me the opportunity and authority to speak to you today. And for that, there are no words of my indebtedness. And so I am very excited to share God's word with you. And, and these words that I actually prepared for two weeks ago, or, or I guess for last week, um, are the very words that have sustained me and brought me through to today. And I hope that they do the same for all of us, carrying us through into the future days. So let's pray, and then we're gonna dig in. Sweet Jesus God, thank you. Thank you for who you are, that not for a moment are your eyes blind or unable, but that you are always with us, always sustaining us, always with us. God, I, I give this time to you, that you be glorified, honored, and praised. We love you. We need you. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. So the saying goes that a picture is worth a thousand words. And I believe that's very accurate because I could stand up here and in hopefully less than a thousand words because we don't have that much time, um, but hopefully be able to paint a picture for you about my daughter who's almost three, Eliana. I could tell you about how she shushes me in the car when I try to sing along to a song. I could tell you how when she wants some privacy that she'll say, mommy, back up, further, 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 close the door. <laughs> At three, it's ridiculous. Um, I could tell you how she carries her purse, oh so particularly, or how she sashays through the house, or how many of you have experienced, she'll say, hey you, and then proceed to boss you around. I, I could tell you all these things, or I could just show you this. My daughter is sassy. You see it, you, you get it, because a picture is worth a thousand words. Pictures are important. And there's a very important picture painted for us in Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings, with two wings, they covered their faces, and with two, they covered their feet, and with two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord God Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. In the year that King Uzziah died, that is a very loaded statement. For me, and for some of you, I'm gonna date myself here a little bit. For me, this would be like saying, in the year that Hurricane Alicia hit Houston, or the year that the um, shuttle Challenger blew up, or the year that, that baby Jessica fell in the well, or 
the year 2001, or the year the Sandy Hook shootings took place. Now, each of these events seem unrelated, but each of these events shattered and scattered my security. I was four years old when my family very quickly put all our stuff together. And we took just the essentials and we fled from our home in Clear Lake City to the other side of Houston because a category three hurricane, Alicia, was on its way and we were gonna be in its wake. And I don't remember a whole lot about the events of that, but I do remember that the very eye of the storm passed over the house that we had fled to. And I could hear the over 100 mile an hour winds battering the house as I played with my little ponies. And then a tree was thrown down where we were staying. And my security was blown away. I remember when I was in elementary school and I was surrounded by my friends and teachers and we were all anxiously anticipating watching the launch of the Challenger. My, my dad worked for NASA and our whole community was, was wrapped up in space exploration in one way or another. So meeting astronauts was common day occurrence and everyday talks were about the latest mission. And so we were all very excited to get to watch this launch because this particular one had a teacher aboard. And we watched so excited until the unthinkable happened and seven people lost their lives too soon and my security came crumbling down. I, I was eight years old when I became glued to the television for about 58 hours watching as the whole event surrounding Jessica McClure falling in the well was unwrapping. I, I remember waiting for the next update, the latest pictures of, of what they were trying next to get that poor little baby out from 22 feet under the, the ground and she was stuck in just inches of space. And I remember thinking, if it could happen to her, it could happen to anyone. And I remember even picturing myself in a dark chasm meeting a miraculous rescue. And my security was chipped away. I was getting out of my car to go to Dallas Theological Seminary um, classes, and a fellow student got out and started telling me about how the first plane had flown into one of the towers. And what he was trying to explain to me sounded so foreign. I, I, I didn't understand what he was saying until I went and saw the pictures and video being relayed to us on the news. And my security came crumbling down. I sat with my five-month-old baby as I watched the media try to make sense of a senseless slaughter of elementary children. And I knew one day I would take that little girl and walk her through the doors of a local elementary and release her into the hands of somebody else. And my security slipped away. Each of these events shattered and scattered my security, revealing that home is not always a safe place to take refuge. That even a community pulling together for the common goal can be undone. That being a child doesn't keep you from falling into darkness. That even the most powerful nation is not immune from intentional devastation. And that even as a parent, I can't guarantee complete safety for my children. There is no security here. That's the temperature of Israel when Isaiah penned the words, the year that King Uzziah died. There was no security there. They were in the midst of, of uncertainty, a time of, of shifting sand. King Uzziah died around 740 BC, and he'd been reigning as their king for 52 years. And, and he was a good king, a, a prosperous king. He, he did mostly good by the nation, except for that, that one time when he tried to take on priestly duties and it left him leprous for the rest of his days. But he had protected his people been there for his people, kept the enemies at bay, but now Uzziah was gone, and the kingdom was in transition, in jeopardy. Who would lead them next? And would this 
new king be able to protect and provide for them as Uzziah had. Assyria was rising in power and ambition to the east, and so being invaded was a very real threat. They needed a strong king. There was a breach in security. And it's in that climate that Isaiah saw this strange vision, this vision of the Lord surrounded by bizarre angelic creatures, these six-winged seraphs, which literally translates into fiery or burning. And I'm sure it's different for each of us, but for me, having creepy creatures around doesn't bring me security. Um, And it's probably different for you, but for me, it happened a couple years ago. There was this movie coming out, and so they started circulating trailers. And they started circulating the trailers for where the wild things are. And now, many of you probably have grown up with the book, or, um, I'm sorry, I can't look. Um, Grown up with the book, or reading the book to your um, children or grandchildren, I didn't, I was so unfamiliar with this creepy creature that is up there haunting me right now. Um, But I would literally have to avert my eyes from seeing these commercials and and turn away because it would almost make me cry. And I know that's weird. I don't claim to be normal. (laughs) But to me, that would be like having these burning, fiery creatures swarming around in my presence. I can't imagine what Isaiah felt. But these agents of worship, they covered their faces and their feet. And no doubt this brought to Isaiah's mind some things that he had read in the Torah, an occurrence that Moses had with the Lord. He he came in contact with a burning bush and he was told to remove his shoes for where he stood was holy ground. And he instinctually covered his face for fear of the Lord. Or there's a time when when Moses had his face put in the cleft of the rock so that God in his glory could go by because no man can look at the face of God and live. And so I'm sure as, as Isaiah saw these creepy burning creatures flying around covering their faces and their feet, he thought they know their place. They know to be humble before the Lord. And so not only has Isaiah's whole world been turned topsy-turvy because the king has died, but now he's standing in the presence of the Lord. He's being encircled by burning creatures. And the temple shakes with their voices, and it's filled with smoke and the Shekinah glory, the divine presence of God. This revelation makes those crazy lightning storms and and flash floods we had just a couple of weeks ago seem mundane and ordinary. And to add to this peculiar scene, these burning winged creatures started crying out, holy. They are proclaiming that this God is set apart, different. And then they repeat it a second time, holy. To emphasize he is very different. And then finally, a third time, holy. To articulate unequivocally, he is absolutely different, unlike any other. And this is where Isaiah finds himself, that fateful year that King Uzziah died, searching for security and stability in the presence of the Lord of Lords, and king of kings. And the only response that Isaiah can have is woe to me. When face to face with God, who is absolutely different, unlike any other, who is not just holy, but completely holy, absolutely beyond the shadow of a doubt, different than any other set apart holy, it is in that instant that Isaiah realizes he's an unclean man living among an unclean people. And and it would be so easy for fear and condemnation and insecurity to enrapture him, and yet the Lord provides hope, redemption, and security. God touches the life of Isaiah with forgiveness 
and atonement. Just as God does for us today, forgiveness and atonement through the holiness of his son, Jesus Christ. We're reminded of this in John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save the world through him. It is in the year that King Uzziah died, in the midst of an empty throne in the kingdom, that God gives Isaiah a picture that he reveals that he, he is the one true king. God alone is the one who brings true security. Everything else is is shifting sand, a mirage of stability. He alone is the rock on which we can firmly stand. And it is in this stark contrast to the events of the day that God is divinely seated on the throne, bringing hope, redemption, and stability. Isaiah received a vision of Israel's true king, Yahweh, who is more than adequate to lead and protect. He is there with his people and for his people, and it is this picture of the true king, high and exalted, that Isaiah stands witness to the majesty of God. This powerful and unusual picture caused the prophet not only to evaluate his own life, but also prepared him to act and speak for God. Today is graduate recognition. The the day when we celebrate those who have graduated, those who have finished high school and are about to embark on a whole new adventure. Their sense of security it is already in limbo as they face this, this whole new world opening up to them. But I wonder how many of us in other seasons of life feel like our security is unstable as well. So many of us place our security in what we have, whether it's the, the house we live in or the paycheck we pull in, the community around us, having others who are like us or even have common goals, the season of life we are in, to be young and innocent or more mature and full of wisdom, the nation we belong to, the land of the free and the home of the brave, or even the position we hold, head of household, deacon, CEO. But all these things are fleeting and unstable. Our security can only be placed in the Alpha and Omega, the one who sits on the throne now and forevermore. It is in him alone we can trust, that we can trust in and find security no matter what the circumstances. And that's what happened here with Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, the king that the kingdom had known, the king who had reigned for 52 years, the king who had kept the country prosperous and protected. He was gone. The throne was empty. And God revealed himself in the most loving and powerful picture as the king seated on the throne. There is security in him who sits on the throne. Not the throne that was left empty after King Uzziah died, but the throne that has never been empty. It is because Isaiah received this revelation of truth that he boldly proclaimed, here am I, send me. Because this truth, it was too good to keep to himself. Too good powerful not to share with those who were suffering in insecurity and instability, looking for something to stand on. Isaiah was compelled to take the message that the throne is occupied and stability is present and the reality that our God reigns. 
for the graduated senior. It is a picture that God is omnipresent, never leaving nor forsaking, always walking with and guiding. For each of us in the sanctuary without our pastor, it is the picture that God is the good shepherd who leads and protects with his rod and staff beside quiet waters. For the family with water inside their house, it is the picture that God provides solid ground, a firm foundation in the midst of a storm. For the individual facing another round of chemo, it is the picture that God is the all-knowing great physician, adequate to faithfully handle any diagnosis. For the child whose parents are, are trying it apart, it is the picture that God is father, a hen who selflessly covers over her young. For the individual facing a week of pink slips, it is the picture that God is for you and that he has a hope and a future in mind. It is in seeing God for who he really is, the one true king, that we can accurately see and evaluate ourselves. We get a vision for who or what we have been placing on the thrones of our lives and the false sense of security we have been basing our days on. As an intern in Dallas, I, I worked for this great man who loved the Lord. He was a larger man who struggled with his weight until he found a program that worked. And after he found that program, he, he started being the biggest mouthpiece for that program, telling everyone the change that it had made. Until one day, God interrupted his life and reminded him the true change that Jesus Christ made in his life. And he had realized what he had put on the throne. He had put health instead of life on the throne. And he repented and went back to being the biggest mouthpiece for God who affects life here and now and eternally forevermore. It is God who is king. He is the one who brings hope, redemption, and stability. And he continues to ask in this place today, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Will we be a people who remain bound to the unclean, unsettled, and the unstable? Or will we be compelled to share in vivid detail the Lord who is high and lifted up, who faithfully brings hope, redemption, stability? There is security in him who sits on the throne. And that picture needs to go viral. So to each of us, here am I. Send me. Let's pray. Sweet Jesus, those are the words of our heart. Here we are. Send us. Because there is a world out there hurting, broken, insecure, trying to find stability in shifting sand. Help us to always stand on you as our foundation, as our rock, as the one who can take any and all things that life can throw at us. And God, help us to share that truth with the world around us so that we all get to taste your hope, your redemption, your stability. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray.